Principal funding for art tasting with Julian Zugazagoitia has been provided by DeBruce Companies, with additional support from the Francis Family Foundation, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Coming up on Art Tasting, Dayglow drinks, Ew. <laughs> and super sour candies are on the table to greet director emeritus Mark Wilson. Julian and his predecessor swap the kind of museum stories that no one else can. They don't know what is going to happen to them. Are they going to get shot out of the sky? Has the Japanese general staff even heard of the surrender? For an enthusiastic audience in Atkins Auditorium. Welcome to Art Tasting, I'm Julian Sugasagoitia. Each week on this show, I'm joined on stage by someone who shares our passion for art, sometimes is one of our great curators or a great and amazing collector. But this week, it's even more special. We're bringing someone who has deep perspective and knowledge about how this museum has grown. It is our esteemed former director, Mark Wilson, a man who played such an important and intrinsic role in building the Nelson to what it is today. Mark knows so many stories, stories about how we acquired art or the people behind making those possible. He wasn't around when William Rocking Nelson started the museum, but he speaks so eloquently about the pioneering people that you might believe he was. Our audience had a great time, and I'm sure you will too, as we settle in for an hour of art tasting with Mark Wilson. And it begins already very grandiose. 1933, the opening of the museum, and it is the biggest museum west of Philadelphia. Perhaps. Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, the odds this museum would turn out the way it has, and the scope, scale, and excellence were very poor. Mr. Nelson said, buy art for the delectation and enjoyment of the people generally in Kansas City. But it was really Mr. Nichols, and Mr. Jones, and Mr. Volker who put ambition to Nelson's wealth and to the wealth of his family and Mrs. Atkins who built the building. It was they who determined the scale. And nowhere better can you see that than in the case of Kirkwood Hall. This at the time is still, at the time this building was built, there was only one hall, I think, grander and greater, and that was the one at the Metropolitan. The other great hall of museums, the National Gallery Rotunda, was yet to come. Nice. This was bigger than St. Louis, bigger than Minneapolis, bigger than older museums, bigger than its models even. Yeah. And, and that set the stage. And yeah. I think what was amazing, first of all, also the word you mentioned in the will of, of Mr. Uh, Nelson, delectation. And, that, and that, is, that links so much to the art tasting, to all the senses, to, to enjoyment. It means, it means to enjoy, but it means to savor something and to have a certain amount of discrimination between the good, the better, the best. And, and it's a wonderful 19th century word, delectation. And again, it is, it is these three trustees mm -hmm. that carry the wishes Absolutely. that create even a larger museum that what they anticipate could fill at that moment. And they have they, they all of this They were foresighted. Empty. The foresight was to, is all across the board. They knew what they thought a museum should be. The model was the MFA Boston. Uh, but to have built this building twice as large as they needed, this part is the only part, the east part on the first and second floor, were the only parts fitted out with galleries. This vast west section Half the museum were just huge open spaces from rough concrete slabs to steel beams at the top. And over the next 40 years, 43 years, they would fill in these empty spaces on both floors, saving this museum millions and millions of dollars. And it meant that we never had to add to the building until the block addition. Until the block addition, of Extraordinary course. Extraordinary foresight, planning. Now, also, the, the, the drawings that we see here, early on, it is, this is Versailles meets Bernini. This is kind Versailles of- Versailles yeah. meets Bernini. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you, there, there, is a, there are drawings and sketches of huge curved colonnades coming together with an opening that was supposed to be down here. So that's the Bernini part. This is the Versailles part. And where are you? You notice 48th Street? 48th Street is gone. Remember the Nelson trustees owned all of this land, what is now Tice Park. This is 47th Street, going right through here today. This is Tice Park, and down here is MRI. 
this should look quite nice today too. I mean, there is some, uh, some well, possibilities. <laughs> now look. <laughs> I don't shy away. <laughs> don't, now, don't give up hope. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Now, I'm not sure you want a reflecting pool down there, but you do have an arrangement with the city that will allow you to use this property. Totally. To a certain degree, neither Ms. Atkins nor Nelson were collectors. Of neither, neither one, really. And, and the DNA of the institution actually begins in a very healthy base because somehow, I mean, many of the big institutions we know, the mm. Frick or, or the Getty or, or many others that had these big patrons, then little by little they have almost to clean up or to mm -hmm. reinvent. We started with a clean slate and buying what was at the time perhaps the best that was available and again with a lot of daring. And when trustees began to buy, at the same time they began to construct the building, <clears throat> they had the second largest acquisition budget in the USA surpassed only by the Metropolitan Museum in New York. So they had money, and they did this very intelligently. Again, the trustees quickly discovered that they were no match for the art market and that they better get some advisors, and they did, in three major areas. And this is very telling. European art, including antiquities, American art, and Asian art. And they bought pretty much, as Sullivan said, what other <coughs> museums would at the time. You've great. Uh, great medieval art, this great piece from 12th century Spain from Vic. And at the time, remember, it was very much the fashion, and it still is fashion, to buy Islamic art. Where does the word arabesque come from? This is probably the greatest carpet. The 17th century, early 17th century Royal Kushan tapestry carpet with gold and silver threads woven into it. It's the greatest Persian carpet in the United States, period. This was one of the first things the trustees ever bought. And it stood the test of time. And it is a taste of the time, too. It is, it, it is it's what the- It's a taste of the time. But I have to say, I don't think Tish never really you know, goes out of goes fashion. Out of and this is also one oh, of our masterpieces. Oh, this is wonderful. They bought this right after the museum <clears throat> opened. This is uh, Mosca, uh, a high Renaissance artist. This over life side. This, th those of you who are docents knows what happens when you get seven and eight year olds in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They all go, yeah, tee hee. Uh, this sort of thing going on uh, because they're smooching and they don't have any clothes on and all of that. But this Mosca is the greatest Renaissance sculpture in the United States, flat out, and was made, uh, was originally commissioned uh, for Palazzo Strozzi. In Rome. Yeah, in Rome. They bought uh, also decorative arts, so buying 15th, 16th century Limoges enamel uh, was also something. It was, it, this went along with buying uh, with great antiquities and medieval uh, objects. These were the object deluxe, the mm -hmm. taste of the 30s. They were, they were rare. Yeah. They were rare, very rare, and especially at this level of quality. Should you have had a Durer painting? <clears throat> yes. Should you have had a Raphael? Yes. Uh, but there was a, a real Midwestern value-oriented, if I can use a nice modern euphemism, mm -hmm. Uh, in other words, the trustees were tight. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Nichols' correspondence is full of arguments <clears throat> about how he's going to beat the art market. And by God, he treats the art market like a commodities market, OK? Mm. No, really. So, uh, these are going to go down 10%. So we shouldn't pay these guys from the art market. And who do they think they are anyway? Just telling me what to do. And you know, you know, they want to be treated like little front lord front lords. Well, my advice to you about the art market is occasionally you can beat the art market by good luck. But on the whole, you can't. Interestingly enough, they didn't buy the sort of thing that was all that popular on the East Coast. That is to say, you know, they, they, most of American, early American painting, as you know, is people's ancestors. Uh, portrait paintings. And when you think of early uh, American painting on the East Coast, mm -hmm. there's tons and tons of <coughs> portrait paintings. Fortunately. Uh, they avoided most of that, and we didn't actually get our, our great uh, portraits until quite a bit later, thanks to Crosby Kemper. But this is what they bought in 1932. But also, and thank goodness they did. Great, but also opening, thing. opening yeah. very early on to being global, to being encyclopedic, well, they were way, and I also think, with way ahead. Native American. They were mm -hmm. more progressive in the scope of what they bought mm -hmm. than any other museum. <laughs> For example, their model, Boston, didn't mm -hmm. collect a great Santo Domingo pot, such mm -hmm. as this one. Oh, you saw that great Sioux 
uh, chief's war bond, their definition of America was far broader and actually far more progressive, less provincial than probably anybody else's definition of America at the time. It says a lot about what they thought this museum should be, what Kansas City should be, and it tells you a lot about what their vision of America was. is going now, to be. Now, at the same time, in a more traditional mm -hmm. way, following what Philadelphia was putting as <clears throat> period rooms, this is one of our period rooms, and yes, we had more. Yes, this is the Hooper Room, yeah. which is really quite one. This belonged to, was used by General Gage, who, as you may recall, was uh, one of the British generals during the Revolutionary War, it was used by him as a headquarters house. It was very much in the, muse the world of museum science, of museum installations. During the 20s and 30s, had been set kind of the Philadelphia model, where you created environments. And we used to have many more period rooms, uh, most of were, which were really not authentic. And so following the mm -hmm. taste of today, we decommissioned those. But this idea of the environment is a tradition here, and I think it's a very important one. Not necessarily buying a period room, or a fake period room, but that the environment itself should be conducive to a really productive encounter between you, and the visitor, and there. And today what we have in this period room, and actually I invite all of you to see this exhibition, is, is the mm -hmm. Cannes collection of silver. Yes. Now, by a twist of history, of course, the silver that we are featuring there is American silver. American here which, from this period. Th from this period, yeah, and, and of course he, would have, he, he, was, he was on the wrong side of history. Otherwise he would have owned this kind of thing. He was just particular. on the wrong side, period, come on. Of course, in many wrong sides. <laughs> Now, we have also Impressionist, early Impression American well, this art. Was, this was amazing to me. The mm -hmm. trustees were extremely conservative. And so was Nelson. Most of you know about Nelson's 30-year rule. Can't buy a work of art with his money unless the artist had been dead 30 years. So what do you do? Well, fortunately, this Robinson, Robinson which this is one of the best, I, I think, American Impressionism, they bought it, despite mm -hmm. the fact of their conservatism and their clear partiality toward, you know, uh, Western early, European or, art. Western, yeah. Western European and American traditional art. You would not expect in 1932 that a museum in the middle of the United States was buying the, some of the best Indian bronzes, Indian paintings from 1,200,000 years ago. But they did. And this was the beginning mm -hmm. of your tradition of South and Southeast Asian art. And thank goodness, after all, what high school or college kid doesn't at some point in their career get enamored with Buddhism or Hare Krishna or whatever it might be, 50s. But they also bought what I consider to be the most important, the most expressive and spiritual of seventh century southeastern sculptures. This great standing image of a Buddha mm -hmm. from what today is on the border between Thailand and Cambodia. Uh, but it is, stands as the greatest of the early Indo civilizations of South uh, East Asia. They call it a Mondavarvati period. And it, you go, do go up there and look at this piece and just stare at it in the face. And this youthful image comes across. And the spirituality and the humanity of that piece is just stunning. There's, and again, it's it, that kind of vision that drives now it, generations. Yeah, this was not expensive either at that time. At the time, yeah. yeah. And they just did it. This happens to be an acquisition, Kagetsudo Ando was one of the earliest and most important, and this happens to be a masterpiece. And the trustees did a brilliant job uh, of buying. You have actually a very large collection of uh, ukiyo-e painting. You have uh, a very small but very choice collection of Japanese prints, some of the best. And you have what the Japanese consider, believe it or not, the second best collection of Japanese textiles in the United States is here. Sigmund, Sigmund comes and then well, Sigmund, Sigmund gets involved. has a very distinctive eye. Yeah, has, uh, Sigmund has a creative eye. He has an eye that goes outside his time, goes beyond his time. He leads the way. And he was, remember, he's only 24 years old. He's in Beijing. He's a student studying himself. His mentor, Langdon Warner, has been hired by our trustees to be the consultant. Langdon takes a boat over to China, stops in Japan, goes... They meet, they meet up, Langdon takes Larry around, his old student from Harvard, takes him around, introduces him to various well-known dealers, and they decide they want to visit the deposed emperor, Pui. So by the way, they had to bribe the way in. You didn't get an appointment to see without a little, <laughs> some connection cash. Connection cash. <laughs> and the connection cash being duly paid, 
uh, they got an appointment with the manager of affairs, and Pui would come running in. He'd just gotten his motorcycle, a European motorcycle. It was a Zundap. But they negotiated uh, with the manager, and they walked away with two great pennies. This was so far ahead of the taste of the time. This is what the Chinese elite like, this painting by Chen Xun from the 16th century. Uh, of the lifetime, it's a longhand scroll, painted entirely in color without any ink, of the life cycle of a lotus, from the, life, the lotus's first blooming mm -hmm. to its maturity that you see here to finally its withering and death. And then he accesses also things that are more traditional, more... Like this ding. Exactly. This is what you would buy if you'd been at the Mad or Boston or the Freer. You'd buy great It's bronzes. more predictable. Yes, this is a very lovely 12th century BC. This is... But this is the rare. This is... Sickman recognized this. A dealer didn't know... There was no set price for anything in China. Okay? So how do you determine a price? Well, what you did in the art market is you would ask all the junior buyers, the one at the lower level, to come in. You'd show them something special, and it's, assuming it was something special, as this jade B. Then you would move up after the uh, interest had been expressed by the lower level buyers, which Sigmund was one. Then you would move it up and you'd, the, the big boys had more money, would be brought in, you'd see how f you could escalate the price. So Sigmund is invited to see this by the dealer whose name is Huang Bochuan. Sigmund knows what the routine is and knows that as soon as he leaves, you know, this is and it's going to certainly be bought by somebody else. So using, he used Chinese protocol to preserve his position, so to speak, to sit on it, literally. And in Chinese protocol, as long as you're drinking tea, the host has to keep filling you up. <laughs> <laughs> so Sigmund sits there for hours looking at this thing, drinking tea, drinking tea, until he finally wears out Huang Bo Chuan. And probably, I don't know, I get, you know, it's Sigmund's bladder versus Huang Bo Chuan. Exactly, patients. the first one who goes to the restroom <laughs> and, loses. I guess so. <laughs> and he went, that's how Sigmund got we it. We got this amazing jade. Yeah, and it's, it is the most famous and, jade. And we have, this and, is one of my favorite pieces. Oh, it's it, so it, delicate, yeah, it's so beautiful. Yeah, this is the one piece the, the Chinese is amazing. Are, are sore about. Because it was hacked out of an imperial commission about 524. Uh, it was commissioned early. It took several years to complete this great cave at Longman in north central China, a Buddhist cave. And on either side of the door into the cave, there were images opposite the door and around the sides. On either side, the emperor and the empress shown coming to worship the Buddha as patrons. Just was much to Sigmund's regret, hacked off the wall. And over two years, he and the, our conservation department put the pieces together based on photographs that Sigmund had taken. Sickman had, had visited there by, on a uh, horse cart and walking all over North China to these sites with a Zeiss icon camera, had taken them. They turned that into a, a lantern slide, projection slide, projected it on a wall, and then using that in a sandbox, got pieces until they all fitted together and then plastered it. Down, put it up in the wall. So he saved also cultural he heritage. He saved and, this cultural heritage. And perhaps nothing better than this piece yeah. that was covered this, in snow. This wonderful piece. People come from all over the world. This is one of the most spiritual sculptures surviving from any culture. People come, they look at it, and they meditate on it. It just reaches out to you. It has, when you stand in front of it, it does seem to engage you. And it's a very distinctive piece. But Sickman found this in the back outside yard covered with snow of an art dealer. And in order to look at it, they took a broom and had to brush the snow off. That is some idea of how, how little this stuff was esteemed. Mm -hmm. And it got back here just in the nick of time for the opening of the museum. And so this great piece, which was made, uh, shall we say, in the uh, 11th to 12th century, somewhere in far northeast China, out of one big chunk of wood. This is definitely striking. Now, in a more intimate... Incredible. It's our, our, oh, our, this, this is, is this our is this is you, those of you you've got to go upstairs and see this painting. This is one of mankind's humankind's great 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 treasures, the great Xu Daoning landscape scroll. And I'm sure that if if God wants to take up residence on Earth, this would be the place. It's a virtuoso execution in terms of technique, brush strokes, washes, but the images of nature are so they are believable. But they're so beyond our world. Sickman was sound asleep one night in 1933, the end of 33. Door knocks. Well, he had a big compound in Beijing. His manager gets up, goes out, 
and there's somebody else's servant there, package under the arm. Servant walks in, and they wake up Sickman up, Sickman goes out. My master wishes to sell this painting. I'm talking, it's late in the morning, it's early in the morning. Sickman looks at it and says, oh my God, uh, you know, this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And what's going on? Need some cash right now, 3,500 max. Chinese were not using their own money, they were using Mexican minted silver money. $3,500 max. I guess that, that is the only time in history Mexican money was worth anything. <laughs> <laughs> but it was good to know that in China they took it. It was max. $3,500 max. Well, Sikkim didn't have that kind of money, but he has a comprador, a person who's his kind of mentor and who fed works of art to him to then feed Nelson. And that man's name was Otto Burkhardt. He runs over to Otto's house, borrows $3,500 max from Otto, pays this fellow off. Well, and the, can, the work comes back to Kansas City. And of course, it is now considered one of the all-time great treasures by, China, by everyone. And it probably, it is the greatest landscape hand scroll surviving from the Northern Song period. There's no question. I mean, it's, it is one of the top, I would be in my top 10 of all-time great works of art of all civilizations. So it gets back to Kansas City. And who, in fact, owned the painting at the time? a big, very powerful, important official named Zhou Bidao. And he was the mayor of Beijing. And he'd been out gambling. So? Now it's here. And now it's here. And, and don't gamble. Exactly. Unless you can afford to lose. <laughs> We're but, jumping you know, ahead. One of the things that is, is interesting, too, is that you know, the 30-year rule, Mr. Nelson's 30-year rule, well, the trustees really didn't want to buy something this avant-garde in 1932. Here is this fabulous Van Gogh, but no. And this kind of credit goes to, I have to give credit to Effie Seacrest. That name may be known to some of you, but Effie Seacrest was a, one of the, the great teacher, art teacher of the day. Had private courses and taught everywhere. She was also something of an art dealer. She strong-armed, single-handedly, the trustees into buying this painting in 1932. And in 1932, it was by far the most avant-garde thing in the Nelson. And it's also because Van Gogh died young that you Well, can, you we all know, you know he did himself in in, 80, in 89. Exactly. So, there was so the proper 30 years had passed. So this is one of the exceptions and to the rules of... of yes, of and what do you do if you can't do that? Well, as many of you know, in 1934, the year after the museum opened, the Friends of Art was founded by William Thornton Kemper and some others, with explicitly to make up for, to compensate for, the restrictions of Nelson's will. So the Friends of Art. But which purpose. was very independent of the equivalent of Friends of Art today is a, 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 membership, a, a, a membership program within yeah. the museum. But the Friends of Art then was completely autonomous, but with mm -hmm. that idea of buying art independently mm -hmm. and giving it then to the Nelson. Yeah, this was the first thing they ever bought. Uh, it's a dead pheasant. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be better examples as we move uh, along. And it, <laughs> it was not a promising start. And with that, let's move along. <laughs> yeah. Well, promising starts actually were in education. We were very, very oh. avant-garde and pioneered in education. Yes. And this, this is, is an image this, of that. And I like to think this is the part of the Kansas City spirit. Mm -hmm. You cannot wait until someone's 20, 30, 40 years old, until they're grown up. You have got to start them when they're young. And no program has been more important to us in fulfilling this role of delectation and enjoyment than the education program founded in 1934, composed from the very first and still the foundation of touring school children with volunteer docents, interactive as you see on the screen, kids are all asking questions and back and forth, classes. On Saturday, I can't tell you how many people of that generation of the 30s, 40s, and up to the 50s to the demise of the trolley could come here on their own, feeling perfectly safe, on Saturdays, and come to find sketchbooks laid out in Kirkwood Hall, and they could take crayons. Our guards were trained to be babysitters. <laughs> and, and, and you would go in and fill in the lines with the colors. And that builds up not just education, builds up generation after generation of goodwill, of people for whom the Nelson was very important in their formative Years. Actually, that is also, and it's important that it definitely it is a docent volunteer program. Yes. Today, many of you are here 
And that is such an energy and some mm -hmm. continuity from Junior League that was volunteering. The junior League and then our own docents, and our own docents and together. Yeah. And he used to recognize some of the early docents, some of still <laughs> schooled coming. Well, this was a program too, a Saturday program, mm -hmm. a puppet program. And a person whom I very much admire and like, named, whom you all know, Ollie Gates. Ollie Gates came here on our school program for a Saturday for a puppet program. And Ollie lived in a predominantly black neighborhood. So our school was predominantly black kids. And they were all mixed up, white and black. And for Ollie Gates, that was the first ever integrated he had experienced with white kids. That was the year 1944. And so I'm very proud that's of this the magic of music in music. institution mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. crosses these barriers of culture, time. Totally. And, and still doing it. And it's still doing it. It's very now, important. Now, the, the, the innovation part of the museum or introducing new technologies came very early on. As we've we can always, see. <laughs> always, tried, always tried to keep up with te using technology. Yeah. This is late 50s, early. And you can see this is kid is going to get a double dose. <laughs> now, look. You see the eyepieces there? These are eyepieces, and you look in there, and you're supposed to see a series of images, like a Viewmaster or something like that. And then the, the, um, the acoustic guy, the, acoustic the, time, guy yeah. the, the tape goes along with it in sync with the images here. But he's getting, presumably, two, two different it's, it's, it's a double take. Well, he's already multitasking. He's preparing yeah. for the life of doing three things at a time. Festivals were already part of We've, we've always Olsen. done this. I and mean, if festivals. The, Nelson Atkins, as far as I can tell, Kansas City always liked some kind of party. And uh, up to the time I retired, I think I had attended 25 consecutive jewel balls. That's a record in of itself. I mean, you've, you've, established, you've established so many records. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, no, I even heard about the, the jewel ball uh, when I was living in Taiwan. I used to have a shortwave radio on Armed Forces Network. And I heard about, in the late 60s, the museum in the Kansas City, a debutante ball being rushed by protesters. Sure wow. enough, it was a jewel ball. Interesting. Arm, made Armed Forces Radio, big deal. So, okay. but, but going oh, back oh, this to the great, great moments of, 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 of this museum this and of This is opportunity yeah. strikes. And sometimes you can take advantage of enormous dislocations and opportunity. We all know World War II. Larry Sickman, had, of course, spoke perfect Chinese, been trained at Harvard, been in, living in Beijing in the early 30s. Comes the war, Sickman then joins up with Chenault, who earlier had founded the Flying Tigers, you know, as a volunteer air corps. Basically, the Chinese had no air corps uh, in World War II fighting the Japanese, so the Americans provided the air corps. Sickman is head of all aerial surveillance, and then based on his surveillance and evaluation, he calls out the bombing strikes from the 14th Air Force bombers. And they were assigned B-25s, as of which this is one. Sickman's surveillance play, camera plane, is specially equipped, and this is she. Her name is Diane, after the uh, initials of the pilot's wives' names. Mm -hmm. Well, <coughs> we dropped the two atomic bombs at the end of the war on Japan. Japan surrenders. Two days later, Sickman and his colonel decide that they better go find out what's going on in Beijing. They desperately want to get to the Japanese staff and debrief them, in other words, intelligence, to find out what, you know. They take their, <coughs> their plane, the Diane, and they fly to Beijing. They don't know what is going to happen to them. Are they going to get shot out of the sky? Has the Japanese general staff even heard of the surrender? <coughs> they finally land. Lo and behold, a series of black cars lined up, the entire Japanese general staff <laughs> there, they surrender to Sickman and Colonel Murphy. <coughs> well, they didn't want to surrender to the Chinese because they treated the Chinese so badly, they didn't want to do it. So Sickman has a quarter of a million dollars of U.S. cash to bribe people to get intelligence. Quarter of a million cash in 1945. He goes to see a friend of his who'd been in Beijing during the war on the French side, the Vichy French who were allied with Japanese. And he was working in the embassy, a man named Dubois, who was a great connoisseur and before the war had been part of an art dealing family called Lou. He married C.T. Lou's daughter. That was the greatest art mm -hmm. dealer of the time. Guess what? The only money worth anything is American money. Chinese currency doesn't exist. It's over because the Japanese had occupied China. Japanese occupation money isn't worth anything. They lost the war. <coughs> so Dubosk sells Sickman. Show him the next. 
Shel Sickman's four paintings. They were all hand scrolls by the pupil of this person, another, and two other great masterpieces. You've got Cho Ying, Over the Landscape, and one fake. Turned out to be fake. So <clears throat> there is Sickman, borrows the money from the quartermaster his suitcase, <laughs> gives it to Dubois, takes the four paintings. So on the way back to Kunming, they're flying high at 30,000 feet. I don't know where they got the gas to get back to Kunming, but they did get gas, and they flew fly back to Kunming. And the Bombay of this plane is full of Japanese swords surrendered by the general staff and these four treasures. Sickman quickly wired, and I don't think he got a hold of the trustees. Trustees cabled him some money, which they apparently were able to do, and so he paid back the quartermaster's corps before anybody could discover. <laughs> I think in our lifetime, being a museum director doesn't get any close no, to this kind of excitement. No, you know, not like at all. some leaks here or there, no. uh, some provenance issue, yeah. but but no surrendering generals to us. No us surrendering <laughs> generals. After the war, actually, everybody think most people think that he bought many of. The, he did buy some great masterpieces before the war, and of course the, the four. Diane paintings, we could call them. But it's after the war he really gets going. The things that are still in America, and he buys such things as the Great Lion, buys one masterpiece after the next. Or he gets Catherine Harvey to pay for this, the great polo players. This is a great story. Sigmund's traveling in Los Angeles, and walking down in a decorator shop on La Cienega called Lowy's. It's still there. Some of you may know it. And he walks in, and he sees this. This is my god. This is a great Jin dynasty. 12th century, right around, uh, a little bit before, yeah, right around the year 1200, north central China, Fun River Valley. Sickman knows the style, the school of sculpture. My God, it's fantastic and it's in such great shape. The paint on it is from the year 1349. And, and, and this is one of and, his you know, also greatest of, acquisitions. Remember that we, this museum, Philadelphia to a much lesser extent, but we in Honolulu were the first museums to discover Chinese furniture. A lot of that has to do with Sickman's friends in Beijing before World War II, people he met up with, who were Dubosc, another one, the same man, the Frenchman, but also the German architect, Gustav Ecke, who had been trained in the Bauhaus and saw in this simple Chinese furniture something that was very sympathetic to his Bauhaus That's aesthetic. Pretty, yeah. And just began by, Sickman <clears throat> learned about it, we began to buy it. So we amassed the largest collection earlier than anyone else and one masterpiece after the next. Then it's there wonderful. is, of course, the end of relationships with China. The victory of the communists over the nationalists resulted in a complete and total embargo on everything from China, including art. Yeah. And you had, the, had to have the most ironclad affidavits to prove that you, the thing was out of China before October 1, 1949. So what does this do? It basically ruins the market in Chinese art in the United States. What's in the United States, that's it. And so Sickman buys what he can, but he turns to Indian art. And Sickman liked Indian art very much. And on his way back to Kansas City, 1935, he bought his first pieces of Indian art in New Delhi. But he never bought, you think, well, he must have bought Japanese art. Huh. All this time, up to 1958, never bought a single piece of mm -hmm. Japanese art. But when he did, this is what you got, the great Kaiho Yushos. Uh, from the early uh, 16th, late 16th, early 17th century, which were at one time registered national treasures and are your greatest examples of that great tradition of Zen ink painting in Japan. And the Japanese. 50s is also when Joe Kelleher starts and this yeah, the highlight and Joe also. Joe Kelleher, this, is, a, this is an masters. unsung hero. There's a real lesson in all in Joe Kelleher. He was here a very short time, about five years. But it shows you what a one individual can do to make a difference in the course of a museum. Joe Kelleher was hired to be the, in 1954, in uh, February, to be the curator of basically European art, Renaissance and Baroque, with responsibility for medieval too. And Joe proceeded to buy one masterpiece after the next. Let's just look. Largely, yeah. No, You're great. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love these Rubin sketches because here's the directness of the brushwork. You see how the brushes are so active. And he goes and he buys the great Rodin. And, and these are just a few slides. And of course, this. This is a good story, too. You know, the petition? Yeah, of the Art Institute. Again, yeah, a young number of artists. students got together 
And they got this huge petition going for trustees to buy the Monet. Well, they didn't need any persuasion from Kelleher to buy this, but Kelleher bought a great many things. He also took the Friends of Art in hand. And from this point on, the Friends of Art really began to buy some great things. Things like this. I've just selected the Hartley. The Hartley. Mm -hmm. What's one of the great Harleys? Was it 1913? Mm -hmm. I think uh, Berlin painting. But it's one of the really, really great early Hartleys. And the Friends of Art bought that under Kelleher's, with Kelleher's direction. And also it's the beginning of great gifts, like yes. Mrs. Spencer's work. Mrs. Spencer, uh, for Ross Tiger, yeah. mm -hmm. was taking care at the time of so-called decorative arts, he was taking care of American art mm -hmm. and antiquities and drawings. I mean, that was the Nelson at the time. There were only mm -hmm. two or three curators trying to cover the entire globe. But this is probably Ross's great croissant, 17th century, fabulous. Just the most active, swirling bits of curves and rocks and so forth, all beautifully gilt by one of the great masters of the time. And but Crosby Kemper Crosby giving Kemper a lot of American art. With Ross, mm -hmm. a wonderful partnership. Ross favored um, kind of home, home genre scenes, but his real triumph mm -hmm. was this great church. Purchased directly, and this is just before the American art market takes off. I'm going to tell you something I shouldn't. It was bought for $180,000, 1977. Anyway, Ted came in 1959 and continues buying old masters, uh, of which I think his most successful purchase was probably this great Jan Stein. But Ted, what Ted understood best, I believe, he had an understanding of Impressionist things. That's where he was really at his strength. Not in American Indian so much, or certainly not in African, but remarkably good in that area. And he bought this great Morisot. This is one of the great Morisots. When you look at simply the activity, you see all the activity? This is gouache. All the gouache and, and, and pastel just rubbed and active. And he's, he's known perhaps for sacred circles, that is like the signature Mm -hmm. Exhibition that it puts still is, you know, the Kansas City in the map of the world because it was for the centen uh, bicentennial. It was for the bicentennial, and it's it goes to London. It was so yeah. well received. It comes back to Kansas City, and there are queues around the museum, mm -hmm. and somehow we associate Ted Co with with, with Native American. Sacred Circles yeah. is still the pivotal exhibition mm -hmm. in the history of appreciation, collecting, and study of American Indian art. Yeah. Those of you who may remember it, in 19, beginning of 77, it was nine, over 900 objects, huge, and it is, it simply was the pivotal point. And I think, though, of the Ted, surprisingly enough, didn't buy that much uh, great stuff for the uh, Nelson or acquire that much in American Indian, except for this this great Northwest Coast box chest, which uh, he bought and is still, I think, a, with family crest, yeah, yeah, a whopper. Well, Gaylord's exhibition of the Plain Indians that we're preparing will have yeah. to try to top Sacred Circles. So we're it's, trying to call Sacred Circles the return. The, you know what the interesting thing is? Mm -hmm. This exhibition, Ted's Sacred Circles, brought so many important treasures from Europe. Remember the Europe, where they were the explorers? Well, they took all the interesting stuff back to Europe. Mm -hmm. So it's not in the United States, all this early 17th century, 16th and 17th century. It's all in Europe, Germany particularly, England, and so now, Sacred Circles brought a great many of those pieces to Kansas City to be seen in America for the first, for the time. first time. The same opportunity exists with right this. Right now, exactly. There's yeah. going to be. And there's some super duper things at K. Brown Lee. And so this is the very bad oh. reproduction of a work that we all love, of now, course, our it's, Rothko. It's but the anecdote behind. You know, <laughs> now the, anecdote, the way you see this on the screen, actually, the screen I'm looking at behind you, it's actually much better. But uh, mm -hmm. Ted took the Friends of Art, continued Joe Keller taking the Friends of Art in hand and doing his best to direct them. But remember, I have to recall the process to you. The chairman of the Friends of Art Selections Committee, together with the curator, Ted, or his predecessor, Joe, would go to New York, usually, and select five or six works of art that any one of which the museum would be happy to have. There would then be a town hall type meeting, and there was like the election of the Pope. <laughs> uh, you would keep voting until one was chosen. Uh, and so there were very impassioned speeches. And if you read the minutes of these meetings, uh, emotions ran very high. And they were sentiments that were really hot. And on the particular occasion, of, and Ted got this through, thank goodness, Pat Ullman, who was not one to hold back, and was a prankster as well, 
used to drive around in a, 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 a left, a right-hand drive Rolls Royce with a gorilla in the left seat. <laughs> <laughs> and Pat got up and just mad as a hornet, says, by God, this is the first time we've tried to fill a hole with a hole. <laughs> <laughs> but it's here, and it is a it great, is one of those undisputed masterpiece. Totally. And Mrs. Bunty. This uh, is another donor. Uh, that, some of you mm -hmm. may, may remember the sales from Little Gallery. And it filled a need at its time. And it, then the need was superseded by, fortunately, a very lively gallery scene here in Kansas City. But Mrs. Bunting decided she was going to set out to help us reshape the Asian collection. And the big hole and the big need was Japanese art. So she began to collect Japanese art with the intention of giving it to the museum. And this great mid-17th century, probably 1630s album by Tosotatsu is one of the examples. You would not have much of a later Japanese collection, ceramics, paintings, no matter what it is, without Mrs. Bunting. And this is very significant. This was the 60s, on up to her death in 1982. From this point on, donors become critical to the Nelson from the 70s on. Because at that point, Mr. Nelson's money is now being used entirely for operations. There's none left for acquisitions. And donors become critical, as they are today, for acquisitions, programming, education program, exhibitions, reinstallations, just general operations. And that's so, also the moment in which you start to make incredible acquisitions like well, this. Well, this is, you know, Roger, I mean, this is from... Yeah, when I became director, I saw a museum. Everybody said, Mark is just going to turn this into an Asian art museum. Uh, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> they don't realize I have just as much training in Western art as I do in Asian art. But my job was to rebalance the museum to seek opportunities that could be fulfilled. Similarly, so Roger and I moved on. We bought the great Vigée Lebrun or the great Van Heysen. But this one also created a lot of uproar oh, early I got on. Hell. Exactly. Now, this, I felt, had to be in Kansas City. I felt, mm -hmm. it, you know, this was against uh, trend, against all the critics to buy this. Yes. And the, uh, the critics said, oh, God, Thomas Hart Benton, he's awful yuck. And the trustees had bought into that line. Sickman didn't care for him. Called him Hillbilly Baroque. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, Hillbilly Baroque. And I said, no, 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 no. This, I'm sorry, this, Thomas Hart Benton is important. This kind of painting is important. It's just out of sync with the taste of the day. History will restore it to its proper place. We had to have it. And I just said, Kansas City, we can't let this go. And at the time we bought this, this was the most expensive thing the museum had ever acquired. And some of you, yeah, it was over $2 million. Wow. But I'm happy to say it is certainly the greatest Thomas Hart Benton. Yes. And it is one. <laughs> I think that it is and will remain one of the great icons of American painting. And you may recall that it caused a stink when the star, Jim Hale, who was also a person who was not to be held back, <laughs> uh, put it on the front page of the Sunday paper. I don't mean the front page of the A&E section. I mean the front page in color. <laughs> and we both got holy heck from people about this awful nude. And the whole thing went back for two weeks. And of course, the paper loved it. Finally, it was all polished off by a limerick. There once was a preacher named Green who thought Persephone obscene. He knew what was lewd, this psalm-singing prude. If it ain't got no clothes, it ain't clean. <laughs> <laughs> that was the end of that. Well, these, we, have, oh. we have incredible things, like, like this George O'Keefe that yeah. is also before the flowers and completely well, abstract. You know, we love George O'Keefe for the wonderful flowers. There, there are a couple of very wonderful ones over here at the Kemper Museum. But the, this uh, is 1914 this or 17? 1917. 1917. George O'Keefe is doing things like this? Completely abstract. Don't yeah. you wish he had just kept going? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Or the great, tell us about we the kept, great you know, we kept, This, is, well, this uh, is an amazing After Crosby position. decided to build his own museum, we had to find somebody else. For, for, certainly for American art, but one of the things that's so gratifying about this community is how people step up. And as the building, the new building, the block building began to take shape, Landon and Sarah Rowland came forward and said, we want to make sure that American art, which will remain in the old building, looks good and it's up to strength. So they contributed to the reinstallation of American art and to the acquisition. And all my career, I had looked for the coal for Kansas City the grandfather, the patriarch of American landscape painting, 
Never did the opportunity, the right coal, the right quality, together with the money come together. But thanks to uh, Landon and Sarah, we were able to land the absolutely impeccable coal in pristine condition to go along with the reinstallation of the American Penny. And then the other big initiative, I mean, We've been talking that we have been very lucky in three dimensional, from the Mosca to uh -huh. the Wanin. A sculpture has been an amazing thing. And early on, we had the city was given this incredible Henry Moore that was positioned by Henry Moore himself Yes, here. it was. And it kicked a little bit the tradition of the garden. The sculpture garden that we have just renamed after Donald J. Hall. And it evolved from from a couple of sculptures, then the Henry Moores, thanks to the Ablas. Well, the sheep's piece <clears throat> was very important, and we recognized that we wanted the outdoor experience to be developed. Here's all this parkland. Let's put it to good use. Let's turn it into an art park. Open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with great sculpture. We had a huge hole in this museum, thanks to Nelson's Will, which was called the 20th, modern in the 20th century. How do you deal with it? Well, the best way to deal with it was, is monumental sculpture. After all, you can't put very many of these in your Park Avenue apartment. <laughs> Though the competition isn't so great, the price yes. is good, excuse me, and you're dealing with some important masters of the earlier 20th century. Don uh, Here. said, this should be really grand. We're not just gonna plunk them around, we're gonna redesign the park. And so the Dean of Landscape Design was hired, Dan Kiley. Dan they Kiley. developed a master plan for the entire park system, including Southmoreland and Tice, all of which can sub this was the part that was built. And here you see the basic design without the block building, which then runs down here. And this changed this changed also the, the, the fact that it, oh, it was more than the Henry Moore. So this is well, when this it became is, well, the not Kansas only City. More than the, exactly. It became the Kansas City Sculpture Park. And then now and this is gets a, a kind of attention. You can't escape this. This becomes the icon of the city. And, I've always said that you know when people want to get married under those things that you've really won the mm -hmm. battle. And that was a tough battle. It was very nasty. I have to tell you, it was the nastiest thing I've ever fought. And, uh, and there are many collections that sprung under your leadership and of course in preparation also for the redeployment of the new building, of the block building mm -hmm. to which we're going to arrive. So the African collection well, uh, or photography this, perhaps. Yeah, this is called Opportunity. And I believe that you have to be realistic about the opportunity, but you had to be prepared to seize it. It seemed to me that African art was an area in which the Nelson could build a collection and still get great things, those things that anybody, you don't have to be African to understand. And another great, another end, we could do that. And I had one sum of money that I could save up. So I would save it up in every 18 months, two years, by one great thing. You do that long enough, pretty soon you have 10 great things and 15 and that's the nucleus of the collection. Meanwhile, I tried to target money, just like a rifle shot. Don't scatter the shots. We're not that kind of museum. And all and of this were masterpieces yeah. that we put. But this, this has a special a memory story. for you. And yes. exactly. this piece we belonged to, to the great one. New York collectors, the greatest ceramic collectors. They were named Falk. They gave us two pieces when they died. Then everything was to be sold at auction because they wanted it to go back on the market and other people to have the joy of collecting as they had. Well, I had remembered this piece for 35 years, and I was on the phone bidding for it. I timed my bid so that I would end up on my highest bid that the trustees had approved. And sure enough, we got it, obviously. And the underbidder happened to be another very important museum. And so this is a lesson. Just, you won't always win this one, but keep after it, don't let it go, and just be dogged and tenacious about it. Well, which was what was needed also to accomplish perhaps one of the greatest things yeah, that this, this is, city has seen. There's been a great many joys building on the legacies of my predecessors, but I think most people would associate with me with the very great block building. And again, this definitely was, when we first saw it in the press and everything, changed the paradigm of what a museum should be. It was d designated one of the best expansions of museums it was of the, the decade, and I think it continues to be uh, in that it's, it, Believe it or not, <clears throat> well, first of all, it was the, the architectural marvel of the year 2007 when it opened. That was pretty nice. Yes. It has yet to receive a bad review that I know of. I, well, there's been bad letters to the editors. <laughs> but uh, we have professional reviews. It's been everywhere. It's won innumerable awards, accolades studied left and right, and it's even made 
a, a several recent publications of the top 100 buildings of all time of all from times. all places. So to be in the company <clears throat> of the Taj Mahal is pretty good I, in my <laughs> book. <laughs> At least for this time being, yes. <laughs> and so we have today the tools. We have, again, the legacy on which to build yeah. and, and the trajectory. So as you can see, this institution has an incredible DNA. The pressure and the responsibility to take over and continue is amazing. It is. Uh, but I, it daunted, and I will try, and <laughs> we'll just work hard. <laughs> yeah, work hard. But we have great inspiration you, you and, know, again, we, great we support. Ha we, we have this inertia that began <clears throat> right from the beginning. We, we have the trunk of a tree that our predecessors built, and they gave us so many options for branches to grow. Some of them will grow because of opportunity. Some of them will grow because we seize them. Some won't go because there's no opportunity or we failed. But we have, I think, Mr. Nelson could never, ever have imagined that his museum would turn out so well. Well, with that, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Mark, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you. It's always great to have Mark Wilson at the museum, and to this day, he still has his parking space in the garage. We were thrilled that he could join us for this final edition of our tasting. He's overseen so many changes, so much growth, and has been so instrumental in building a foundation for the kind of work that we are proud to carry on today, in making the Nelson Atkins the place where the power of art engages with the spirit of community. Please join us again at the museum or online to watch other episodes of Our Tasting. I'm Julian Sugasagoitia and I'm delighted to be with you. Principal funding for Art Tasting with Julian Zugazagoitia has been provided by DeBruce Companies, with additional support from the Francis Family Foundation, and by viewers like you. Thank you.